In this interview, I talk with Keith McKenzie, a meditation teacher and Buddhist chaplain for the British Armed Forces. He works extensively with veterans in retreats and ongoing community projects. We discuss Keith's career as an elite soldier in the Parachute Regiment of the British Army and how severe PTSD ended Keith's 22 years in the fire service and led to heavy substance abuse and years of suffering. We learn how a profound spiritual experience altered the direction of Keith's life and saw him immerse in meditation and Buddhism, discovering tools to stabilize his mind and heal his trauma, tools that he now shares in his work with veterans through his charity Sadaya. It's a really fascinating story, so without further ado, here's Keith McKenzie. Thanks for joining me, Keith. Yeah, you're welcome. So you've got a really fascinating story. Um, I was first of all going to ask you, how does a corporal in the parachute regiment become a Buddhist chaplain and a meditation teacher? But then just before we started talking, you were telling me about being a sort of kind of hippie in uh, in Holland in the 70s. So maybe I should ask, how does a hippie in Holland in the 70s become a corporal in the parachute regiment who then becomes a Buddhist chaplain and a meditation teacher. Yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, reaching that final stage uh, of becoming a, a chaplain mm. uh, takes a fair bit of life experience. Uh, I, I mean, most, most of the chaplains come from some background of uh, quite heavy and heady uh, life experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, and that that helps in what you have to do. So you know your experience uh, helps in the way that you know what people are actually going through when you you know when you talk to them. You've, yeah. be, you've been there, and it allows them. You know, I always start when I when I either do a presentation or, or talk to anyone. I, I let them know what my history is, mm -hmm. so that they know what I'm talking about and talk coming from. But yes, I mean, I was uh, a hippie working um, in Holland in, in the 70s. Uh, it was a great time, lovely people. Uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't what was in my blood. I wanted to be a soldier. So my father had made us all, all, of, all the boys, there was four boys he had, and we're all engineers. Um, so he made me sit my trade uh, and work at it before I joined the forces. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, that period gave me a bit of insight into, you know, being abroad. It was the first time I'd actually been abroad. So, you know, going going over there, working and talking to other people, open, open my eyes and uh, certainly to the experiences of travel uh, and giving me a taste for it. Mm. But then I suppose uh, I came back from that and there's, there's always been something within me that's uh, been missing and mm. always searching, constantly searching and it's constantly externally searching. Um, and I think that is uh, what most people do, is mm. search externally and until they maybe get to a point where they realise that the search hasn't to be external, it's to be internal. Did you have a, a, any kind of religious upbringing or what was your upbringing in terms of, of that sort of side of life? Well, my, my father was a, a Canadian. Uh, and he, he, he had been brought up as Jehovah's, uh, a Jehovah's Witness, uh -huh. uh, and he hated it. He was made to stand on street corners as a kid, uh, giving out the good news, and was mocked by his friends. So he, he, he learned to hate it. And so his side of it, he was uh, an atheist. My mother was Catholic, mm. uh, but they brought the boys up um, as Episcopalian. Uh, Scottish Episcopalian, yeah. uh, but I, I was and my brothers were dragged to church yeah. by my mother. We hated it, and I, from the offset, um, could not understand 
what it was they were trying to tell me about God and uh, the Bible and stuff. I just, I just didn't get it. I didn't get it at all. And it wasn't until actually I found Buddhism that I started to understand Christianity. I always share this story about, uh, you know, what, what is it that makes you search for something, or what is it that builds your character? Um, and for me, the concept of karma uh, is what builds character. Um, I was born, uh, I, I suffered in as much as that I had a, a problem uh, as a youngster. I, ha I was a bedwetter right up until about the age of 13. Mm -hmm. um, so that in itself, you know, builds a certain kind of character, you know, so I was constantly trying to prove that I wasn't weak. Right. Uh, and that's what led me to the army, not just to the army, you know, I had to be the best of the best of the best. Um, mm -hmm. So I could really prove, prove myself as not being weak. And that was a constant theme throughout uh, that section of my life. Uh, and that led to uh, me coming out of the army after having been in the parachute regiment and the pathfinders because I made my way into the pathfinders mm. um, and then on to SAS selection uh, where I was actually shot uh, and that put paid to that side of it and not long after that I got out but I got out and joined the fire service so I could see that the or I couldn't see anything at that time, but I, the, I saw later on that that was just this constant um, progression of, of proving uh, that I wasn't weak and searching as well, you know. So I was constantly, even in the fire service, I had to be doing something that was extreme hmm. and, uh, and became a rope rescue instructor and a swift water rescue instructor and an urban wow. search and rescue instructor and attended many incidents uh, involving it. The, the fire service led to my own PTSD. Uh, the, my military service, uh, although I was shot and crashed in a helicopter, they weren't um, anything to do with the traumas saying that my nightmares were all military based um, oh. but I think that was just because it led to uh, imagery of anxiety um, which is where my nightmares were trying to go so they used the military but at times it was military with the guys from the, the fire service and it would change back and forth in the nightmare but the the fire service was one trauma after another um, and as I now know uh, through speaking to several psychologists that this what they think uh, trying to recreate the initial trauma um, and they're still yeah. not sure exactly what that initial trauma is it could be a uh, birth or it could be mm -hmm. something you know like a trauma for a child is something that's not a trauma for an adult and, but yes. a, a trauma for a child holds, you know, a, a list as long as your arm of uh, effects uh, and future effects. Implications. Oh, totally. And there's lots of, um, you know, they're, they're, they're now coming round to the very fact that we'll, we'll probably be changing the name again from PTSD to something else very shortly because they're finding out that there's a thing called complex PTSD. So yeah. I would imagine they'll probably come up with a new name for it shortly. But really the complex PTSD, the, the complex part of it is, you know, what is it that leads someone to that position where they get PTSD from an incident mm -hmm. and the guy next to them doesn't? Yes. You know, so really it's the character of the, the two individuals. Um, and as far as I can see, 
coming from a philosophy of Buddhism, mm. that character is created by karma. Mm. And by karma, you're talking about the sorts of conditions that and events that affect somebody and drive somebody or create somebody's um, imprint of their personality, that sort of thing, or their character, as you're saying. Or is it a sort of, or do you mean the sort of, because some people, when they, they think of the word karma, they think that means something like, if what goes around comes around, if you do something bad, then something bad will happen to you. Some people think that's what the word karma means. Yeah, it does. In a general term, it does. But, um, you know, if you do something bad, if it's negative, you know, I always say negative. If you do something negative, then it is at some point going to come back round to get you mm. or, or to try and repair itself or fix itself. So, you, you know, you're given, you know, you're given this opportunity and it's, it's very much like um, Charlie Morley, who you've spoken to, said about nightmares, you know, nightmares are dreams that they're trying to tell you something, but you're not listening or you don't see it. So they continue and they get louder and louder until, you know, we see them as nightmares. And they're really trying to tell you something. Yeah. Um, I mean, and, and life's like that itself as well. You know, if something happens, I mean, if something happens to me now, um, I, I can quite easily laugh it off or, or smile because I, I feel I'm paying off negative karma. Uh, in my life, when I when I understood karma, um, it, it was the sort of biggest realization for me, because then there was no one to blame, not yourself or no one externally. It was just a set of systems, uh, you know, circumstances and events put in place, mm -hmm. and so there's no one to blame. So therefore, if there's no one to blame, then there's no guilt and no shame. Um, and, and you can then settle down to look internally at really what the whatever problems you you perceive you have you can look at them and look at it internally and that is where I went with this you know finding mindfulness as mm -hmm. as as a tool to use in daily life mm -hmm. um, and using it in daily life you know that's what I try and Put across to the guys when I'm teaching is you know it's all well and good sitting in meditation and sitting in meditation gives you uh, it's, the, the sitting in meditation is like the going to the gym you know you're training yourself for the event and the event here is being mindful in your daily life yeah and really it's like being mindful when emotions come, thoughts, emotions, sensations, when these things come, then you become fully aware. And the word awareness is, is uh, I, I, I tend to use the word awareness rather than mindfulness, um, simply because I like it better than mindfulness. But you become aware of everything that comes at you or whatever comes out of you. So if mm. an emotion arises, you become aware that emotion has arisen and then you can look at where it's arisen from in your body. Mm. Um, and it's that awareness that pulls it apart, that looks at it, that sees the colour in it, that sees the, the temperature of it, that strips it down and investigates it. Um, whilst it's it's because, whilst it's still an uncomfortable feeling, and you look at all of it, and by the time you've done that, you know, nine times out of ten it's gone, and if it doesn't, you just let it be there. Mm. I'd like to come back in a moment to. Sounds like this is this is a sort of advice that you're giving to the veterans on your retreats at Samueling and. You know, in Edinburgh at the cafe, I'd like to come back to that in a moment. But I'm curious about just to clarify that distinction you had there about karma being it's not anyone's fault, it's not your fault, and it seems that your understanding of that has 
open up the possibility of looking at difficult situations, difficult emotions, traumas, whatever it might be, uh, in a very uh, empowering sort of a way. But sometimes pe the interpretation of karma that people can come away with is it's all my fault, actually. I mean, people can realize, okay, I'm not a victim of uh, these people because um, it's just karma. But sometimes people say, well, it's actually all my fault. I must have done something bad in a past life or there must be something basically wrong with me or something. Um, and some, a lot of people, I think, have that kind of a sneaking suspicion of something wrong with them. Yeah. And that all these bad events are happening to them because of, of their failing or, or impurity somehow. Um, how would how do you square how do you come to the empowering interpretation of karma you have without falling into that kind of a, a trap yeah it is difficult it really is difficult because certainly especially in the west uh, westerners tend to to go down that route of uh, eventually coming round to the blames me you know yeah. even, even though they'll start off blaming everyone else blaming everyone else and then right. You know, when it, when you you become a person that has no friends and you see everybody else getting on in life, you start to think, think you know, this must be something about me then. Not right. not everybody, you know, so you start to blame yourself. This blame uh, culture that we live in in the West, especially in this country, uh, we, we tend to blame ourselves for we get to that point where we start to blame ourselves for everything. Mm. And it is a difficult thing. I mean, in the, on the retreats, I touch on forgiveness because mm. it's one of the hardest things to, to, to cover. And you, without doubt, always trigger someone off, maybe a handful of people. Yeah. Um, when you teach about forgiveness, yeah, know. yeah, and you'll certainly, uh, you'll certainly have everyone thinking uh, about their own problems in this area, and, and and it's it sets off a lot of debate, and that's exactly where I've taken it in the retreat. I set it off now instead of doing. I, I used to do uh, forgiveness meditation. I don't do that anymore. Um, I learned my my lesson quite quickly with that one. But I open up a debate so people can offload within the debate structure. Uh, and that works a hell of a lot better than, than trying to do a meditation on forgiveness. What, what, what lesson did you learn when you tried to do uh, forgiveness meditation? Well, people go so deep into their, their own blame. Uh, mm. um, and, you know, the, the, the words I get are like, well, I can forgive so-and-so or, or so-and-so for, for what they did to me but I, I definitely can't forgive myself for what I did you know or didn't yeah, yeah. or didn't do yeah. um, uh, so they can they can forgive others but they, they can't forgive themselves so that's mm -hmm. a a common common theme with with mm -hmm. just just about everybody uh, I come across um, mm -hmm. so really where, where we'll have to go with that is <clears throat> with regards to karma and, and, and blaming yourself for what you did to create your karma, um, I, I, start, I discuss the fact that, uh, you know, they've, they've been given this wonderful human rebirth because they've, they've been given the ability to cognitively uh, proceed in life and, and look at the various aspects of it to try and you know to um, try and push themselves forward uh, with regards to seeing what life is and what this human life is and what all sentient beings uh, are in this life mm. and and maybe then create uh, a furthering of their state within it so if I take it back a step there if we go back to uh, them blaming themselves and being a human being 
with this cognitive ability. It comes at a little price as well, you know, um, all this thinking. Mm. Uh, we, we, we think an awful lot to, because of this ability that we've been given. And, and uh, most times at a certain age in life, uh, although it's getting younger and younger these days with the speed of life and societies and stuff, but they start to um, think too much and, and then the thought process, the mind runs away with itself and uh, becomes frantic and creates lots and lots of problems and then we make mistakes and that's the, the human failing. Mm. is that very thing that we start to make mistakes and yes we make mistakes so we if it's a mistake then it it, it could be a negative mistake and we we pay for that in their karma mm. so coming back to your your story there you were really at the performance level you know in the some of the most elite sections of the of the British Army, the Pathfinders. For those you mentioned, the Pathfinders. For those who don't know, it's um, a unit within the Parachute Regiment. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. That that does sort of scouting, reconnaissance, um, uh, going ahead, um, and that sort of thing. So it's sort of an elite or specialist unit within the elite unit of the Parachute Regiment. And uh, you're going in, in into selection and so on. What happens when s somebody like that? comes out of the army in the fire service there experiencing these difficulties at what point did you did you come across buddhism or what where did that come into play and why all right that, i mean this is where my my story gets a bit um it's very difficult to tell this section of it because it, the understanding was for me and me alone unless you've gone through something similar mm -hmm. um when I, at the, the latter stage of my 22 years in the fire service, I started to produce symptoms of the PTSD and, yeah. and, and could not control it. Um, and it became so bad that I ended up in a psychiatric ward uh, put there by my GP uh, twice. And then... I wasn't going to get back to work, so they, they pensioned me out of the fire service. Uh, I was lucky enough to be under contract within the fire service uh, medical system uh, with a, a, a trauma centre here in Edinburgh called the Cullen River Centre, which is a fantastic trauma centre. And uh, because it was paid for, I, I, I was able to access four years of therapy Gosh. And that did deal with the trauma, uh, the present trauma that had occurred within the fire service. What sort of therapeutic modalities were you exposed to there? Well, uh, we tried EMDR, but that didn't work. So we, she stuck to uh, CBT work. Uh -huh. And that's, that's what we did right through. Um, and, uh, and, and it worked. It worked very well. But I was lucky enough to get that, you know, I mean, within the NHS, you're, you're not likely to get four years of therapy uh, mm. unless it's paid for. Mm -hmm. uh, but it still wasn't enough. Um, I still hadn't really settled it within my own mind. Mm. And it wasn't until, and at this point I was drinking a, an awful lot and taking drugs um, and and over medicating as well with the drugs that the mm -hmm. the NHS were giving me. Anything to stop this madness that was going on in my mind, I would I would use. So after the four years of therapy, and I was still under the the mental health team here in Edinburgh, um, I was still drinking. And one morning I woke up and went to the toilet as I would normally do, and I. Uh, so sort of semi-drunken, hungover state, and I had what was I can only describe as an epiphany, a flash, 
a flash, a, a fraction of a second uh, that was so powerful. Uh, I, I could see everything that had happened, my present state, and everything that was going to happen, or I had to do. Uh, and all of this occurred in the flash in a split second. Wow. Uh, it was it was very powerful, and and it, I I actioned it straight away as soon as it happened. I got on the phone straight away uh, and phoned my my psychiatric nurse that uh, was my CPN and uh, told her what really what I'd been doing. You know the drinking and was very open, very honest with her and told her that I wanted to uh, stop everything. So I stopped on that day, I stopped drinking, taking drugs, over medicating, smoking, smoking cigarettes, everything. <laughs> um, and, uh, and a week later I went down to Sammy Ling for uh, uh, my first experience of Sammy Ling. What, what did you see there in that flash of insight that led you to some, somewhere like Sammy Ling? And did you know about that, that place before? Yeah, I'd known of its existence. Um, and it's, it's a real hard question to answer, but I'll try and answer it as best I can. <clears throat> within, within that flash, I, I did see, my, I saw all of my past, my present, and I also saw the future. And within that future, it was, uh, you know, Sammy Ling was where I had to go. It's, mm. it's as simple as that. You know, there was nothing. I mean, it sounds kind of heady and and uh, miraculous, but it, it didn't mm. seem like that. <clears throat> it just seemed like that was it. That was quite straightforward. Uh, and I was just just to go down there. What I was to do down there, I don't know. I was just to go down, so I went. And what what was it like then to go? Go somewhere like that. I mean, with with that, you, you know, you're describing a lot of the um, of the classic uh, consequences of PTSD. You know, the yeah. the self medication, um, a tremendous momentum of inside of pain and suffering and so on. So you come you come off the the drink and the drugs and over medicating, and then you walk straight into a, a Buddhist monastery mm. what was that like did that uh did this insight relieve you of some of this this uh pain that you were medicating or uh did you have to reckon with that when you got to sammy ling no it it, it relieved me of it in that very flash it, it left and i have to say as well i've read since uh in psychology journals that um it's not uncommon these flashes of insight with uh, people with trauma mm. uh, sufferers, you know, not just military or, or mm -hmm. you know, everybody a anywhere in society that uh, comes up against trauma and suffers because of it in life can have these moments of insight later on after, you know, quite a fair bit of suffering. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I'm still looking into that, What, why that, occurs but um it's certainly um well documented mm. but the fact of going down to sambling where it was uh, uh quiet and peaceful and uh, the energy was just completely different to what uh, i'd ever been used to it, it just felt like part of what had happened uh, in that room uh, that morning, so it, it really didn't it, it didn't freak me out. It didn't. It was just this is what was happening, and I knew this is what had to happen. But I had actually gone down during, and this is my character now. Um, I went down during the drug chat down at uh, Samuelling, and it, it's not really for first timers. Uh -huh. It's quite a full-on, week-long uh, ceremony of uh, 
all day practice and meditation. So I, I, I jumped straight in with both feet, which is my my yeah. want. Um, <laughs> but Can you, know, you give people an idea of what kind of schedule that you were following there for people who, who might not know about that? Um, yeah, I, I mean, it wasn't too bad, actually, as far as uh, schedules go within Buddhism. It was, a, it, was, it was a very late start at half seven. Um, so normally your 4am 4, 4 uh, starts are, are, are where it goes, but I don't think the, the starting time no. is uh, important as long no. as, long as you uh, rest um, between the sessions, it's, it's yeah. fine if you can rest. Um, but this was just, for, for a complete beginner, it was oh, yeah. like uh, from that time right through till half four, uh, doing, mm. doing nothing but meditation and, pra and, and practice because the Drabja is about um, putting out these prayers and practice and Im immense emotions and feelings to the world for peace and harmony. Um, it's quite a powerful, uh, powerful practice. So you're walking in there to eight plus hours of intense meditation practice a day to it from a standing start yeah so That's the intense. first the first two days were uh were quite difficult to accept but my my character kept me going with it i wasn't going to give up you know yeah uh, and it was worth it because it brought me out at the end um to go back to edinburgh and do do my own practice, which I think is where a lot of the real power lies. You know, you can sit in a hall with a lot of other people and, uh, you know, practice meditation. And it is good. Group meditation is good. I'm not knocking it at all. But really, to get to your yourself without the ego involved, because there's a lot of ego involved in group practice, you can drop the ego quite a bit if you're practicing on your own. Um, so I, I started off the first couple of years doing three hours of meditation a day. Wow. Uh, through the day, sitting in this, um, because at this point I was here in this veterans accommodation place where it's a small room, mm -hmm. um, uh, where you've got a bed, a small room, and you eat downstairs with the rest of the guys. and. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a very good, it's a place in Edinburgh called Whiteford House, uh, mm -hmm. run by the Scottish Ve Veterans Residences. And it's amazing because it gave me the freedom and the space to be able to do what I was doing. Uh, but I sat in this room and at that time they had a an issue with mice. They had an infestation of mice. Right. And they were putting mice traps in all the rooms, but I refused the mouse trap. I wasn't going to kill anything. Uh -huh. <laughs> because of my mental state now was focused on the, these sort of things um, so I didn't, didn't have it so when I was sitting in my meditation I had mice running all over my legs and uh, wow. watching them running about and uh, it was it added to the meditation if you like I can imagine what sort of practices were you doing for those three hours uh, simple um Focusing on the breath meditations, you know, like um, a concentration meditation. Uh, it's very simple, just trying to keep your mind focused on the breath and bringing it back every time you drift away with the thought, bringing it back. Uh, and, and just do I, I, that's all I did until I, I got to a point where naturally I wanted to move on to do some kind of other meditation like Vipassana. Mm -hmm. which is um, uh, more uh, about watching how the actual thoughts emerge mm. and uh, what they are and where they go so you know you're, you're, you're more focused on that and more body aware mm. and presumably at this time Akong Rinpoche was the abbot of Samueling. Uh, is that right? Well, um, he passed it over to his brother by, uh, by this point, but he, oh, was, he was still uh, Lama Yeshe. Rinpoche yeah. was uh, the abbot, uh, but Akong would, uh, would re 
turn from his travels uh, wherever he went uh, to help in the world. He'd come back every now and again. And when I was, you mentioned my conversation with Charlie Morley, um, the lucid dreaming teacher. Uh-huh. Um, he talked a lot about his relationship with uh, Lama Yeshe. Um, did you develop, um, you know, you're presumably you're coming back to Sami Ling to, to receive more meditation instruction, or maybe you're doing it uh, solo uh, in Edinburgh. Did you develop a sort of relationship with a teacher or teachers um, who are overseeing this or inspiring you or instructing you in, in meditation as you started progressing? Um, yeah, Lama, Lama Yeshe is, um, <clears throat> you know, he, he's, he, he was part and parcel of it. I mean, it was, I had to, I, I knew I had to go and see him. I had no idea what I was going to ask him. I didn't have a question for him at all. Um, and that that's quite common for people who have not s- seen Lama Yeshe before to want to see him or just be in his presence on a one-to-one. But <laughs> when they do uh, get round to, to doing it, they don't have a question mm-hmm. to, to ask him. So he, he normally just jokes away with you and talks a bit, a bit about life and, and you know, what to do. And if, if you have a question come up in your mind, then you can uh, you can ask it then, and he'll he'll answer it. But normally, what I've found with him, with him uh, is that he answers questions before you ask them. Mm-hmm. Uh, even if you've got one in your mind that you want to ask him uh, when you meet him, whether it's officially or or not, in, in passing, he 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 answers. He's very intuitive. Uh, mm. And he knows the mind very well, and uh, he's done it so often now that it doesn't freak me out, and uh, I'm used to it. But he's been very supportive, very helpful with regards um, the veterans. Uh, in fact, all of uh, Tibetan Buddhism has been very helpful with regards to veterans, right up to the very top with the Dalai Lama. Yeah. Um, he met with uh, the military last year, the early part of last year, um, and and put it out to um, put it out to the uh, Tibetan Buddhists within Britain that they, wherever they can, they help uh, the veterans and the military. So that was very helpful for me in uh, setting up the, the retreats and where to go to, to do the retreats. Um, right. It was quite a natural follow-on to to not ask Lama Yeshe, but him to say to me, <laughs> you know, why don't you bring your veterans down to the retreat centre and do your retreats here? So that's exactly right. what I did. And it was... Uh, by God, it was the best place to take them. Really? So La- you were saying that Lama Yeshe was, was actually the one that suggested to you and, and offered Samuel Ling as a place for your retreats for veterans? Yeah, I mean, I was going to ask him, but he... Yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. One of those ones. Yeah, but he, he answered it before I could ask him. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so... I imagine that saves quite a bit of time in uh, personal interviews. Oh, it does. It really does. If he could just sort of skip the questions, give you the answer. I mean, away. <laughs> I, I'm, and I mean, I'm not joking because I've had only one really serious interview with Lama Yeshe. Oh. Um, the, the rest have just been jokey and because he's answered everything prior to it. And uh, so, you know, the one, the one serious one was questions I had about, um, you know, am I doing the right thing and am I heading in the right direction and uh, is there anything I should uh, take on board with with regards to that direction and uh, he he answered uh, very you know he changes his way and becomes very serious looks you straight in the eye when he's going to tell you something uh, meaningful you know? mm-hmm. um, and uh, 
yeah, you know, he told me to stay focused, carry on doing what I'm doing, slow down a little bit, uh, and do no long retreats. Interesting. No long retreats. Yeah, no long retreats, which was a question he answered before I asked. Uh, I'd imagine, you know, you're talking about your, your character there going to the, you know, the, the elite or the extreme ends of things. I imagine you'd be, you'd be fairly drawn to a, a long, intensive uh, retreat of some kind, oh, brutal kind of. You know. Desperately so. Um, yeah. It's exactly what I want to do, but um, uh, he says no, not just now. Why do you think that is? Well, I think uh, I think he's right in as much as um, I've got too much going on at the moment. Um, yeah. I, I do my practice every day, still, but. As far as uh, as Charlie will tell you, you know, a long retreat, and I've done two week retreats, um, uh, you know, Vipassana retreats, which are quite full on. Um, oh yeah. And but I, I'm talking about maybe three months or even a year retreat. Uh, that's the sort of thing he's talking about not doing. Yeah. And a lot can come up in those retreats you know a lot can happen and it might be that it does change my focus if I did it and I think he's quite keen for me to stay in the focus that I'm on now and it it it, it sort of crosses over well with the the Mahayana side of mm -hmm. Buddhism that the Tibetan Buddhists at Sami Ling follow where yeah. you know you are really out there uh, compassion and action, following yeah. and helping people. You know, so if you mm -hmm. if you you go on a long retreat, you know, I mean, I have occasionally when things get uh, quite full on here when I'm working with guys that have got serious mental health problems, uh, and day in day out, and you you start to go, oh my god, you know, I just like to go away and do a, a long retreat and get away from it all, um, yeah. but then you know that's that's just a that just comes in there but it, it it doesn't stay it's one of the uh tricky things to balance i think is this urge to um to go away and to go and retreat go inside um because you know especially if you have a taste for for the potential of these sorts of practices that you're you're talking about mm. a yearning for that but of course there's also this drive to to be useful or to contribute or to as you say compassion in action yeah and then sometimes people say well the best way to be compassionate is to go away into a long retreat you know sort of emerge uh, levitating maybe shining whatever you know totally fully enlightened and then you can be really really useful uh -huh. i think it's um i think it's a tension that a lot of people who are doing the sorts of things you're doing uh, so you know, in, in service to people, and to have an orientation to the sorts of practices and investigations you're describing, I think it's a tension a lot of people feel, and they feel, oh, I should be doing a long retreat, or, but I can't do a long retreat because I have to serve. Oh, and there's this sort of tension. Yeah, I think you know, I mean, working with these guys and in general life itself you know i mean you don't have to be in this game to experience the stresses and strains of life itself you know just working at a nine to five job in an office somewhere and raising your fa uh, your children and looking after your family uh is stressful enough as it is mm -hmm. and you know mindfulness uh is something that can help with all that if you're engaged in work like this where you know you're dealing with people that are haven't been able to deal with the stresses and strains of life and you know their mind's gone off a bit or or, or risen a level you know we, we all it was the one thing I can remember she used to say you know that mental health is at the bottom no mental health problem at all and at the top the worst mental health problem you can imagine and somewhere in between, we all lie. But there's not, no one's sitting there at the bottom. You know, yeah. you don't sit at the bottom. You're always somewhere. And then we, we fluctuate within it, 
depending on how well if if you believe in karma then you know depending on your karma and uh, what happens to you in life mm -hmm. so for me now um, with, the, with all these thoughts of long retreats gone at the, for the moment mm -hmm. I get so much out of life in general with my practice of mindfulness it gives me so much to use uh, if emotions arise and if emotions arise within what I'm doing uh, I can use those emotions in my mindfulness practice uh, and I, I constantly do that <clears throat> you know day in day out mm. even if even if your day is perfect you know if, yeah. if your day is perfect you have to look at that as as deeply as you would look at waking up with really strong anxiety or depression mm -hmm. uh, because you know what where our problems come from is attachment and aversion so you know waking up feeling blissed out and happy we tend to attach to that you know we want that every moment of the day and every day but we're not going to get it so we, we we're still attached to it and as it goes away it creates suffering for us and it's the same with aversion you know when things horrible things come at us emotions like uh, anxiety and depression we we don't want them we try and push them away or try and run away from them and you can't you just make it worse so that is where suffering lies between attachment and aversion so if we can treat everything exactly the same and you know i've had people say to me you know but you know treating life the same and trying living in a, a level parallel is that not boring <laughs> and well no it's not because <clears throat> it, it's hard work trying to keep that that level so it's mm -hmm. certainly not boring so are you striving for a kind of even keeled um, lack of emotion or lack of feeling do you find that it mutes just to pick up on the on the question that you're saying people ask you do you find it mutes experience you don't experience the highs um, because you're afraid of the lows that sort of thing no no you, you don't uh, you're not striving to have a, a, a lack of uh, negative emotions or or, or or running for anything you you just be where you are you know if a negative emotion comes at you you just let it come at you you yeah. look at it and it's it's Char charlie talks about in you know nightmares if you have a, a demon appearing in uh uh your your night your dream then you embrace it well that can go in daily life as well so you know like if a demon appears like a, an emotion a strong emotion like uh, um, anxiety or depression then you embrace it you embrace it so you know you're not trying to get away from it you you embrace it it's part of you it's yours no one else's uh, so you embrace it and you can look at it and fine-tune that looking um, with it and nine times out of ten as I say they, they tend to just leave drift away uh, but if, if they do say you just allow that and it's in that training which is the mindfulness training yeah. because you really have to look at that in the moment right in the moment there's no point in looking at it in that memory of the past that you had that bad time or trying to gauge something that's going to happen in the future you look at what happens right in this very moment and you you don't look to be happy because happiness is already there, uh, so <clears throat> you just you just be, you know, you just exist with what comes at you, what you've got. And with this sort of availability to feeling now, you're saying sometimes the negative uh, feelings evaporate or to sort of disappear. What remains? What what what's under there when that happens? In your experience, with your uh, practice right <laughs> okay so if you take away I mean this is what you're trying to, you're doing in your meditation you sit down mm. or what I do in my meditation is I sit down 
and I focus on my breath and then I, I bring an awareness so that you're simply resting in that full awareness. Mm. You're even showing the fact that you're focusing, become aware of you yourself focusing on the breath and you're just trying to rest within that awareness. Mm. You know, thoughts come and if you're fully aware, you can see where the thought comes from and it will bypass. You do not engage with it and it drifts away. Mm. That's what you're trying to achieve. And what is there? There's, there's nothing but a lot of insight. Uh, th this is where Vipassana works very well with you know looking at the, the thought as it comes. Because as it comes and you see it going, you know that was just a an, ev an everyday thought of you know that, that your mind throws up constantly. Mm -hmm. Now and again, you get something very powerful, very uh, insightful, and you know then you can that that stays with you. Mm. But you, you know, you're you're not you're not looking for you're not looking to do anything. You just sit and rest in awareness. Mm. There's no there's no there's no magician here. You know, there's no uh, you're not going to get this um, magical uh, wands waving event happening. It's pretty. It's pretty mundane, but it, it it's pretty mundane, but it's pretty powerful at the same time. Uh, it's it's a very difficult uh, thing to describe. Uh, of course, it's it's one of these things that you want to go out there and experience yourself. Mm. Um, the main the main thing for me is, I mean, I'm not I'm not high, high realized enough to. Um, to teach anything other than what I teach now with guys that are suffering. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's ways to reduce that suffering, if not end it. Mm. Or, or, or have te techniques, have techniques that, that can, uh, that can deal with the, can deal with suffering. Yeah, that's a very powerful thing to be able to offer someone uh, and we're almost out of time now Keith but right. let's let's um let's finish up then a little bit talking about your work with, with the veterans um, the sorts of things you're doing with them the sorts of issues and difficulties you encounter I mean we haven't talked a great deal apart from your own experience about uh, PTSD and its uh, various symptoms and and difficulties and how difficult it is to to deal with but uh, you're encountering these things day to day. What what sort of what sort of things are you experiencing uh, in your work, and and what sort of things are you able to offer these guys? Yeah, um, I mean, at the more serious end of uh, the spectrum, I have. I mean, like I was telling you earlier on about um, yesterday, I was dealing with a guy that tried to commit suicide. Mm. and has just come out of a coma from it and uh, another guy that um, uh, went missing um, and simply he had been gift given a house by the, the veterans organisation he's never had a house in his life before uh, so it was you know the anxiety of that uh, he, he just dropped everything and, and ran off and uh, that is very common, and uh, and we managed to find him just the other day, uh, and we've got him back on track, and uh, he's he's moving along. So you know, there's most of it is that helping guys get through things because they're not going to get to a point where they they want to sit in meditation. Most of them can't sit in meditation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that's why. 
working retreats are far better for these guys where they're going down to Sammy Ling, working in the gardens, cutting down trees, uh, knocking down buildings, uh, weeding, digging, uh, and then doing a little bit of meditation at night when they're mm -hmm. really grounded. Mm -hmm. uh, because that kind of work, that kind of karma yoga, as they call it, is very grounding. Um, so, and that's why I've come up with this idea that I'm trying to progress with as a project uh, of a veterans farm and retreat centre. Mm. Uh, we're wanting to buy a, f a working farm and uh, and grow, you know, organically and sustainably. Uh, and the guys come down, volunteer there. There'll be long-term volunteers, short-term volunteers. And then, they, when they're ready, they'll engage in the um, retreat side of things, mm. uh, where they'll uh, they'll do all the, the meditation and mindfulness practices and yoga and all the rest of it. But until that point, you know, they'll work on the farm. Yeah. So people coming to your retreats are, are not going to be necessarily locked in. Uh, they're not going to leave. Med meditation dungeon. Yeah. Uh, no, you know. <laughs> no. And they're not going to le leave um, fully realized either. But they are going to go away with seeds planted and, uh, and, and they will grow. I mean, I've, I have seen it. I've been doing this for five years now and I've seen guys go off and, and do their own thing and get involved in, you know, what they see as the right thing for them. You know, it's what I teach is fine, but, you know, they might not be into Tibetan Buddhism. They might find it in Zen or in the church, you know, yeah. or, or somewhere else, you know, uh, fly fishing or, you know, uh, gardening or whatever. But, the, you know, mm -hmm. it, it gives them that stability of mind and the rest of mind to, to be able to see what it is that, and where they need to go. Uh, that's that's the more important thing. You know, religion um, or uh, philosophies, you, you know, you can take all that out and, and just, you know, stop this unsettled mind. If you just rest it, then people can see what it is they need to do. Mm. Yeah, that's such a, a wonderful approach, you know. You're the work you're doing there you're not trying to convert people or you know get uh, members to some sort of club or group or whatever you're by the sounds of what you've been saying offering tools and support to these guys to deal with the pain inside to yeah. deal with the difficult thoughts the nightmares the uh, anxieties the, uh, and you've been there you know yeah and to offer that offer that support and those tools um, to guys like that, I think uh, veterans or uh, people with traumas f from other sectors is, I think, really tremendous work. Yeah, it, it's. Uh, I mean, it's where I was drawn to. So you know, I'll, I'll keep going along this uh, this yeah. line of work until uh, you know I'm told otherwise. Well, where can people get in touch with you if they want to if they want to help you or support you or if there's somebody listening. Um, who might want to work with you or attend one of your retreats or just get in touch to talk to you. Um, whereabouts, how can people reach you? Right, well, the, the best um, way at the moment, I mean, we've, we've just last Thursday there, we became a charity. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called the Sadaya Charity, S-A-D-A-Y-A, Sadaya Charity, mm -hmm. uh, which covers the veterans community cafe here in Edinburgh and the retreats, the yoga program and the mindfulness program. The best way to get in touch at the moment until we've got a website up and running, which we're working on now, is through the Veterans Community Cafe web uh, Facebook uh, mm -hmm. site. And if they go on there and ask to join, then uh, the you know, I'll, I'll, and it's not just for uh, military veterans. It's for, mm -hmm. it's it's for everyone really. But um, you know, I, what I put in the constitution is that we are open to all veterans of all services. I won't turn anyone away. Mm -hmm. No one is suffering anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, if they go onto the community uh, Edinburgh's 
it's called the Veterans Community Cafe uh, mm-hmm. Facebook. If they put that into Facebook, um, then um, you know they they can join, and they'll see what's coming up and what's on, and uh, they can get in contact. And I'll put those links in the uh, in the description underneath this this uh, interview for people to to follow up on and find that. Well, Keith, thanks so much for uh, coming on and talking to me. You've got a really fascinating story, and I think the work you're doing is is so important and so needed. So once again, if anyone wants to get in touch with Keith, the links will be underneath uh, this audio in the text. Um, yeah, thanks so much, Keith. No, you're welcome.